Thank you. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlow. Scotland doesn't want to be in a separate currency. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Uh, well, I think uh, Scotland should have the ability to choose the arrangements on currency and on everything else that best suit our needs and interests. That's the very essence of independence, and it's why I and an increasing number of people in Scotland support Scotland becoming an independent yes. country. But can I say to Jackson Carlow, I am always delighted to talk about independence, but there is, there is a constitutional issue that is, I think, more immediately pressing right now. In just 22 days, three weeks tomorrow, uh, Scotland is due to be taken out of the EU against our will. There is still no sign of an agreement on withdrawal issues, no guarantee of a transitional phase, and no clarity on our future relationship. So can I give Jackson Carlaw another chance to say something that people might actually want to hear? Uh, will he join with me today in demanding that the Prime Minister stops asking people to choose between catastrophe and disaster and instead takes a no-deal Brexit off the table now. Jackson Carlo. It's the First Minister's own deputy who has raised the issue of currency this week. Scotland doesn't want to be in a separate currency. I was quoting the First Minister herself just a few short years ago when she and her predecessor were telling us that it was Scotland's pound and nobody was going to take it. Who would have thought five years on that the only people who want to take away Scotland's pound would now be the SNP? This week, this week we've learned from the SNP's deputy leader their new plan is to ditch the pound and set up a completely new and untried currency. So, First Minister, any homeowner who has a mortgage in pounds and overnight their salary is paid in a new untried currency, are mortgage payments going to go up or down? First Minister. Well, of course, uh, until a democratically elected Scottish Parliament in an independent Scotland decided to change that, people would continue to use the pound, yeah. which of yeah. course is Scotland's yeah. currency, just as it is the currency of anywhere else in the UK. But Jackson Carlaw confidently talks about what people in Scotland uh, want. Well, you know the way to determine what people in Scotland want? want? That's to allow them to choose uh, in a referendum. And of course, the Tories are so scared that people would choose independence at the next time of asking that they want to block them having that choice. That is deeply anti-democratic. But let me... I think people, people watching this exchange today, I'm afraid to say to Jackson Carlow, uh, are thinking uh, about what is due to happen three weeks tomorrow. So let me bring him back to the here and the now. Three weeks tomorrow, this country is due to be taken out of the EU against our will. We still do not know whether there will be a transition phase and we do not know anything about the future relationship with the EU. Uh, that uncertainty could be removed today if the Prime Minister rules out no deal Brexit. So I'll give him another opportunity. Will he join with me today and call on the Prime Minister to end this uncertainty and to rule out a no deal Brexit at any time? Yes or no? Jackson Carlo. The problem is this First Minister just doesn't listen. There is, there is, there is no majority support for a second independence referendum. And if the currency were changed, here's what would happen. The Fraser of Allender Institute made clear an ITV border this week. People would still be tied into mortgages or car loans, but they'd be paying them off in an untried, unknown, as yet unnamed new currency a clear risk of people paying more. That's the plan your deputy leader launched this week. Worse still, worse still, today we read in the papers that the First Minister's deputy is also plotting another referendum on independence, no matter whether it's legal or not. Another independence referendum is the last thing Scotland needs. So irrespective of the views of her errant deputy, 
Will the First Minister rule out this divisive plan? First Minister. The legal basis, the legal basis for the next independence referendum should be the same as the basis for the last independence referendum. And the only reason we are talking about this issue is the disgracefully anti-democratic stance of the Conservatives, who refused to recognise a mandate won at not just one election, but two elections and endorsed by this Parliament. But, Presiding Officer, we can always tell when the Tories are in trouble because yeah. pantomime Jackson Carlaw makes a reappearance. The face gets red, the arms get waved about. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, people in Scotland will have ample opportunity to talk about the many benefits of becoming an independent country. But we don't have too much longer to sort out the mess of Brexit. So I'm going to give him yet another opportunity. 22 days, three weeks tomorrow at midnight, Scotland is due to be taken out of the EU and we still don't know what follows from that. That could be taking away that uncertainty if a no deal Brexit is ruled out. So for once in his life, Will Jackson Carlaw stand up to his bosses at Westminster and will he join with me in calling, demanding that the Prime Minister rules out a no-deal Brexit and that she does it now with no further delay? Jackson Carlaw. The whole chamber knows that in two short years, Ruth Davidson will be sitting where the First Minister sits today. And a, Scottish, and, a, and a Scottish Conservative First Minister will be answering oh, yeah. questions for a long time to come. But for the moment, for the moment, this First Minister remains in office. So in summary, the SNP is preparing to launch a new currency, according to their Deputy Leader, which would throw people's mortgages and Scotland's economy into chaos. Then, according to her deputy leader, with whom she's now disagreeing publicly, the SNP plan to launch an illegal referendum within a matter of weeks. Another week of the SNP showing that there is only one priority for this government, and that's satisfying Nicola Sturgeon's obsession with a second independence referendum. Enough is enough. First Minister... Order. Just rule it out and let Scotland move on. First Minister. Well, <laughs> at the start of uh, that latest chapter in the pantomime, Jackson Carlow actually had the good grace to laugh at himself. <laughs> he was being so utterly ridiculous. I was going to say Jackson Carlow has lost the plot. I'm not sure he ever had the plot <laughs> in the first place. But let me tell Jackson Carlow what my obsession is right now. It's saving Scotland from the disaster of a Tory Brexit. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't know how Jackson Carlaw plans to spend the rest of his day. Let me tell him how I'll be spending the rest of my day. This afternoon, I will be chairing a meeting. Jackson Carlaw might want to listen to this. Yeah. Yeah. I will be chairing a meeting of the Scottish Government's Resilience Committee. And what we will be looking at is how just three weeks from now, three weeks tomorrow, we can secure medicine supply in Scotland, Absolutely. how we can secure food supply, make sure people in Scotland still have food on their table. We will be looking at how we can protect our economy from the risk of being plunged into recession. All of that time, all of that effort, all of that expense, because a Tory Prime Minister refuses to rule out a no-deal Brexit. It is shameful that the Scottish Conservatives have not demanded that she do so. You know, I've been wondering why the Scottish Tories are First quite Minister, as that's supine enough. as they are. Perhaps it's because, presiding officer, they don't want to stand up for Scotland and never will stand up for Scotland. Question number two, Richard Leonard. An independent Scotland will keep the pound because it is in everyone's best interest. And to try and suggest otherwise flies in the face of the facts. 
that's what Nicola Sturgeon said in 2013. First Minister, if that was true then, why isn't it true now? Can I have some quiet, please, for the questions and the answers? Nicola Sturgeon. Well, let me uh, just share a quote with the Chamber. People in Scotland need a strong party of Labour that speaks for working class people in working class communities. And they are not doing that. Richard Leonard's strategy is a recipe for failure. Uh, that's Gary Smith from the GMB on Scottish Labour. So maybe it's about time Scottish Labour stopped being a pale echo of the Scottish Conservatives and actually started standing up for Scotland as well. Richard Leonard. Uh, well, I didn't discern an answer in that. So let me ask another question. Last night, the SNP finance minister, Kate Forbes, told the BBC, the currency you used the day before independence will be the same currency you used the day after independence. But under your plans, First Minister, that simply isn't true, is it? Because, because what Kate Forbes left out last night and what you've left out in your answer is that you plan to use the pound without a central bank. It's the SNP's very own no-deal exit. And that would mean building up substantial foreign exchange reserves. The Finance Secretary, Derek Mackay, could not tell this chamber yesterday afternoon how much that would cost, but the people of Scotland deserve an answer. So this afternoon, can the First Minister provide us with an answer? First Minister. The position, the position of Labour and the Tories on these questions is utterly ridiculous. Remember in 2014, they told us an independent Scotland couldn't use sterling in a currency union. Now they tell us we can't use uh, sterling without a currency union and they tell us we can't have our own currency as well. Scotland must be the only country in the entire world that couldn't have any currency. It is ridiculous and the people of Scotland know that. So let me tell Richard Leonard exactly what the position is. Order, please. Will be in an independent Scotland until a democratically elected Scottish Parliament decides otherwise we will use the pound which is our currency just as it is the currency of other parts of the UK uh, but again Richard Leonard is asking questions about independence I'm happy to talk about independence any day but people across Scotland people across Scotland are worried right now about Brexit and yesterday we had a member of his backbenches uh, telling us uh, that he is so desperate uh, that he's actually trying to stop his own party conference openly debating Brexit. So will Richard Leonard join with me now, not just in calling for no deal to be ruled out, but calling for people to have a chance again to reject Brexit? Will he do that today? Richard Leonard. Uh, yes, I will do that, and I said that on Tuesday afternoon. But the answer, presiding officer, to the question I asked is that £40 billion of foreign exchange reserves would be required. And that's before we look at the reserves needed to ensure bank deposits. And that's before Derek Mackay's austerity programme to halve the deficit in five years. That's not just a programme for austerity, that's a programme for turbocharged austerity. At the very time, at the very time when the people are crying out for investment. First Minister, this isn't about the best interests of the people of Scotland, is it? It's just about the best interests of the SNP. First Minister. If Scotland was independent right now, we wouldn't be facing three weeks tomorrow being taken out of the European yeah. Union yeah. against our will. Right now, it is because... It is because Scotland is not independent that we have to put up with a Tory government that we didn't vote for. It is because Scotland is not independent that we face being ripped out of the European Union against our will. And perhaps until Richard Leonard and the Scottish Labour Party find it within themselves to stand up for Scotland instead of standing up for the continuation of Tory rule, they will never recover in Scotland and they will never deserve to recover in Scotland.
Thank you. We've got some constituency supplementary questions. The first from Angus Macdonald to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Angus Macdonald. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware that yesterday administrators were called into Grangemouth Haulage firm Duncan Adams, which has operated in the port for nearly 60 years. 132 employees were made redundant yesterday following the devastating news, with 12 being retained short term to assist with the closure of the firm. The priority in the immediate term clearly must be focused on supporting the staff and their families through this difficult period. Falkirk Council have been in touch with Skills Development Scotland regarding pay support and Unite the Union have arranged an advice session uh, for the workforce on Sunday. Will the First Minister help to ensure everything possible is done to provide follow-up support to the families affected and also ensure plans are in place to avoid a backlog of containers at the port of Grangemouth? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Angus Macdonald for raising this important issue? Um, I was very concerned to learn of this development at uh, Duncan Adams College and the impact that this will have on the workers there, the families and of course the surrounding communities. Uh, I can confirm that through our PACE initiative we have already been in contact with the administrators who have agreed to issue PACE guides to all 144 employees. Uh, PACE representatives will also attend a meeting on the 10th of March at the Lee Park Hotel in Grangemouth, which has been organised by Unite the Union and which is open to all redundant employees. Uh, the local PACE team is considering uh, what further support can be provided and I can also confirm that we are in touch uh, with the Port Authority to assess the impact on port operations uh, and I'll be very happy to ask the Minister involved to keep Angus Macdonald fully updated. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister if she would agree with me that no decision should be made by the City of Edinburgh Council to extend the Edinburgh Tram network until the findings of the Edinburgh Tram inquiry is published and all lessons learned. First Minister. Well, I think uh, decisions of City of Edinburgh Council are actually for City of Edinburgh Council to take, and I'm sure... Uh, they will take account of all relevant factors. It's important that the inquiry uh, concludes. It's important that any lessons that come from that inquiry are learned. But uh, I know the Scottish Conservatives used to be in favour of localism. They used to demand that the Scottish Government did more to support localism. So I'm going to do that today, even if they've changed their mind, and say that uh, matters for the City of Edinburgh are for the City of Edinburgh to determine. Tavish Scott to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Air traffic controllers employed by a company owned by the government and who operate across the Highlands and Islands uh, plan to strike next month. I'm sure the First Minister will recognise that that would stop air travel uh, and would create tremendous disruption for uh, passengers across the network, including those potentially flying to hospitals for hospital appointments. Uh, could she set out to the Parliament uh, what her government have done on this matter and what they now plan to do to make sure this strike does not happen? First Minister. Well, it is, of course, uh, disappointing to hear about planned strike action. Uh, Highlands and Islands Airport, of course, is covered by our public sector pay policy. Uh, Heil has implemented a pay rise for all staff, uh, which is a significant improvement on previous years. Uh, they've also significantly increased their contribution to the pension scheme in order to maintain this benefit for employees. In addition, uh, ministers have authorised Heil to develop a retention allowance as part of the Air Traffic Management 2030 strategy programme. Uh, I hope we can see uh, strikes avoided and I would encourage uh, the union and Heil to continue uh, to work together to resolve the outstanding issues. Bob Doris to be followed by Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, the announcement of 120 redundancies and looming closure of Gemini Rail in my constituency is a devastating blow for a skilled and dedicated workforce. Gemini Rail have been unflexible, unimaginative and slow to engage meaningfully in our efforts to retain jobs and operations. Will the First Minister commit to continuing to explore all options to support workers to retain jobs and operations at the site? On which point, First Minister, I would stress that if Springburn was to win the Scott Rail 170 class tender, work that Gemini Rail have staggeringly still failed to bid for, it would provide 30 jobs for three years and potentially kickstart a railway hub model that the Scottish Government is currently exploring. First Minister. Well, can I again pay tribute to Bob Doris uh, for the way in which he is representing the interests of his constituents and agree very much with the latter point that he made. Uh, I was extremely disappointed uh, to receive a letter from Gemini Rail yesterday confirming the closure uh, of the workshops at Springburn and I know this will be a, a very concerning time for workers there and their families. Uh, however, and I want to stress this point, uh, we believe that consideration does still need to be given to potential options for keeping the site open the 
there will be a further meeting of stakeholders at the end of this month to discuss the way forward. Uh, the workshops have worked to complete on vehicles leased to Scott Rail until July this year, and Gemini Rail has retained the lease until uh, March next year. So that means there is uh, time to work with industry with a view to repurposing the site for future rail use. And to that end, Scottish Enterprise has already engaged independent financial advice in reviewing Gemini Rail's model for the site. And we will keep members uh, fully updated with any progress. And Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, the BBC are reporting this morning that BIFAB has lost out for offshore platforms to yards in Belgium, Spain and the United Arab Emirates. The Unite and GMB unions are calling for a committee of inquiry in this parliament. They say billions of pounds worth of contracts and thousands of direct and indirect jobs are going to be lost and they are now on the brink of being lost to state-sponsored companies and companies who hold an unfair commercial advantage or economies which do not apply labour standards which we would recognise. This is not a level playing field. What further steps will the Scottish Government take to secure long-term future for the Fife Yards? And do you accept that we need more direct state intervention to ensure a just transition in our economy? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that last point, which is why, of course, we've established a just uh, transition commission in Scotland uh, on the recommendation, indeed, of the STUC. Um, I think it's important also to recognise that, notwithstanding the very real challenges that are being faced, BIFAB today wouldn't even exist had it not been for Scottish Government intervention. And although uh, there are uh, big challenges for the Fife Yards, of course, we had the good news about Arnish uh, earlier uh, this week. Um, can I say, though, uh, and I indicated some of this last week. I absolutely share the concerns that have been expressed by uh, Gary Smith of GMB and Pat Rafferty of uh, Unite the Union. Uh, the concerns that BIFAB may be facing unfair challenges in securing other contracts. Uh, I want the Scottish Government to work with the unions to fully uh, explore that. Uh, I intend to convene a summit in early course uh, to do so. Uh, we've worked extremely well with the unions and intend to continue doing so. Uh, and in the interim, of course, we will continue to do everything we can with the unions and with the owners of the yard. Of course, uh, the Scottish Government has a stake uh, in the yard. We will do everything we can to help secure uh, work, not just for Arnish, but for the two yards in Fife as well. And I hope we will have the support of the whole chamber as we do so. Question number three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Young people are twice as likely to be injured on our roads. Now, some parts of Scotland have made their streets safer, healthier places, including here in Edinburgh, where a 20 mile per hour speed limit has been rolled out across the city, and in Fife too, where more lives are being saved and children protected from injury, particularly in low income areas. Does the First Minister share my concerns that too, ma too many communities aren't benefiting from this small change that would make a big difference when it comes to tackling the health inequality that continues to blight Scotland? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, can I take the opportunity to welcome Alison Johnson to uh, FMQs? Uh, I, I think it's uh, great to have her asking questions. Um, Firstly, I, I do recognise uh, and share her concern about the statistics that she has cited today. Uh, many local authorities, of course, uh, already have uh, 20 mile an hour speed limits uh, in certain areas, and I would encourage local authorities to uh, consider that where they uh, think it is appropriate. Of course, there is, uh, I understand, uh, members' legislation about to come uh, through this parliament, and of course, the parliament will debate that, and the Scottish Government will continue uh, to listen to all of the arguments that are made. Alison Johnson. Thank you. I appreciate the First Minister's response. The Scottish Government has made some brave and important public health interventions around banning smoking in public places, introducing a minimum price for alcohol. Um, but these policies are effective because they have. They apply at a national level with government leadership. I think the piecemeal approach won't deliver what I know both I and the First Minister want, which is all children to have safe streets. So the health and safety of our children can't depend on which part of the country they live in. So will the First Minister join organisations including NHS Health Scotland and the Royal College of Paediatric and Child Health and back my colleague Mark Ruskell's 20 mile per hour bill, a public health measure that will have the greatest impact where it's most needed? I can give an assurance that we will listen very carefully to the arguments that are made as Mark Ruskell brings forward uh, his bill and I would commend him for uh, raising this issue in the way that he is doing. I think Alison Johnson is right and this is an issue that in government we grapple with all the time, uh, showing 
uh, national leadership on an issue, which, as Alison Johnson has said, we have done on a range of public health issues in particular, but also respecting the autonomy of uh, local councils, which is something people across this chamber call for on a regular basis. So it's important that we do get that balance right, but uh, paramount to importance, of course, has to be attached to the safety of children. So I absolutely uh, commit to listening carefully to these arguments, as I'm sure members across the chamber will do, so that uh, I, I would very much hope uh, the Parliament uh, reaches the right uh, decision on this that gets that balance right. Some further supplementaries. The first from George Adam, to be followed by Maurice Corrie. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Is the First Minister aware that Global Radio, who operate Heart, Capital and Smooth Radio in Scotland, plan to create a virtual radio network to compete with BBC Radio 1 and Radio 2, using local licences to do so? Does the First Minister agree with me that Ofcom must become involved and keep local commercial radio in Scotland local? First Minister. Well, I'm a great supporter of and, and fan of local radio, so I think its uh, place in uh, our broadcasting uh, environment is very, very important. So I hope Ofcom uh, would take into account all of the uh, very reasonable points that uh, George Adam has just made. Maurice Corey, followed by Willie Rennie. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, on Monday this week, my constituent, Mr Phillips, an armed forces veteran, collapsed from a suspected stroke. He waited just, six, just under six hours for an ambulance to arrive at his home, Mulgai, after which he was taken to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, where he waited a further five hours before he was seen by a doctor. He spent the night in the receiving unit as there were no beds available. Does the First Minister agree with me that this is an unacceptable level for time, of time for anyone to wait for an ambulance and an assessment from a doctor, let alone someone who has suffered a stroke? And will she look into the matter with the utmost urgency? First Minister. Uh, yeah, yes, I do agree that uh, on the basis of, of what the member has narrated, that is unacceptable and if he wants to provide uh, greater detail of his constituents uh, case, uh, the Health Secretary will be very happy to look into that. Uh, what I'm about to say does not take away from uh, that particular case and the unacceptability of what's just been described, but of course our ambulance service do a fantastic job day in and day out, and our accident emergency uh, services, uh, although they face considerable challenges, uh, remain the best performing accident emergency services anywhere in the UK, and I think all of the staff who work so hard to deliver that performance deserve our grateful thanks, but we'd be very happy to look into the individual circumstances. Willie Rennie to be followed by Jenny Mara. This morning, the UK Statistics Authority reprimanded the First Minister for the misuse of statistics in response to my question to her at last week's First Minister's questions on NHS waiting times. The letter states, waiting times are a major concern to patients and their families. The statistics informing debates about them must therefore be trustworthy, of suitable quality and useful. We are therefore extremely disappointed that it has been necessary for us to intervene in this way. This is the second time that this has happened recently. Will the First Minister therefore take the opportunity to apologise to the Chamber and to the country for misusing statistics in this way? First Minister. I don't... I, I will... As, as the government always will reflect very carefully on anything that the uh, Office uh, for Statistics Regulation uh, says, the statistics that I used uh, were a, accurate and as I understand it, they are statistics that are available to anybody uh, on request and statistics that will be uh, published by ISD. Uh, of course, it's not the Scottish Government that decides what statistics ISD publish and don't publish. Uh, they decide that and I uh, hope we can have uh, as much transparency uh, and as many comprehensive statistics as possible because that would demonstrate uh, that of course the NHS is in so many different measures the best performing NHS anywhere in the UK. Jenny Mara to be followed by Shona Robertson. Presiding officer there are still electrical apprentices from McGill the firm that went into administration after failure of this government to provide a modest loan there are still apprentices in Dundee trying to salvage their apprenticeships this country's skill situation cannot afford to lose apprentices and I am not convinced that Skills Development Scotland from the representation I've had from constituents are doing all they can. Can she guarantee me today that her minister will follow up every McGill apprentice to make sure that they secure another place to complete their apprenticeships? First Minister. Well, we will do everything as we always do in redundancy situations to make sure that apprentices are placed and are able to continue their apprenticeship. 
uh, Skills Development Scotland works extremely hard to do that. And if Jenny Mara uh, knows of anybody who needs further assistance, then she should bring uh, those people to us so that we can ensure that that uh, assistance is there. Uh, but this, of course, is Scottish Apprenticeship Week. And uh, right across the country, people have been celebrating the success of Scotland's apprenticeship uh, programme. A few years ago, there were uh, something like 10,000 uh, modern apprentices in Scotland. Today, that is 27,000 as we work towards uh, a 30,000 uh, target. So this is a success story and we will continue to do everything we can. When companies, when companies regrettably fail, we will continue to do everything we can to make sure that uh, apprentices do not pay the price of that. And that is an absolute commitment that this uh, Scottish Government will always honour. And Sheila Robertson. Does the First Minister share my concern that in the week that we celebrate International Women's Day, we've seen the creation of a video game entitled Rape Day, which enables players to verbally harass, kill and rape women as they progress through the story? While it's positive news that the gaming platform Steam has decided not to distribute and sell this game, does the First Minister agree with me that we should send out a clear message to other game developers and platform providers that such games have no place in our society in this day and age? And does she think it's time for the UK government to review the regulation in this area? Yeah. First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. And uh, can I pay tribute to Shona Robinson for highlighting uh, this issue this week? Uh, the Rape Day video game is absolutely sickening and appalling. Uh, violence against women, sexual or any other form of violence against women, is not a game uh, and should never be treated uh, in such a way. It is uh, serious and must be treated in that way, so uh, I hope this game is not promoted. Uh, but this shouldn't be down, uh, in my view, to the individual decisions of companies. I do think it is time for the regulations governing this to be reviewed, and perhaps this is something the whole uh, chamber could unite on and call on the UK government to do without any delay. Question number four, Keith Brown. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the UK Government's Stronger Towns Fund. First Minister. Well, to be honest, it's hard to know what uh, our response should be because the UK Government has been unable to confirm any details of the funding implications of this announcement for Scotland. Uh, we will continue to press the UK Government to ensure that Scotland receives its fair share uh, of any additional funding. Uh, as with so many things related to Brexit, the UK Government's plans are, uh, frankly, as clear as mud, uh, but they do suggest that Scotland is continually being shortchanged. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for her response and acknowledge the point she makes about so much of it being unclear, but does she share my concerns about the exclusion of Scotland and Wales from the Prime Minister's Brexit bung? And does she agree with me that this is yet another example of the failing fiasco of Tory Brexit, which one of their own Tory Cabinet Ministers said was like hitting an iceberg, and which is only surpassed by the complete inadequacy of the 13 Tory MPs from Scotland, yeah, each of yeah. whom represent a constituency that voted to remain in the UK and their failure to stand up for Scotland? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, these points... <laughs> These points are important. Not only do we have no clarity on the Stronger Towns Fund or whether Scotland will get any share, let alone a fair share of that, we still uh, have no clarity uh, regarding the future of structural funds or the so-called Shared Prosperity Fund. Uh, we've also heard that the UK Government is to provide an additional £140 million to Northern Ireland, but with no indication of equivalent consequential funding for Scotland or for Wales. Now, we welcome the additional funding for Northern Ireland, uh, but there must be confirmation uh, that Scotland and Wales will be treated fairly. Um, of course, in sharp contrast to the, the Brexit bung uh, of the Prime Minister this morning, the Scottish Government has announced uh, the projects that will benefit from our £20 million Regeneration Capital Grant Fund. Uh, not money to persuade anybody to vote for anybody, uh, just money to ensure the regeneration of communities the length and breadth of Scotland. That's a government getting on with the day job and the UK government could learn lots of lessons from us. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to help people who have bipolar disorder. First Minister. Bipolar disorder is of course a very serious mental illness and we want everyone in Scotland to have access to effective mental health services uh, when they need them. That's why we've set out 
in our programme for government, a £250 million package of measures uh, to do more to support positive mental health and prevent ill health. Uh, the funding uh, for a package of new measures uh, comes in addition to £150 million of investment over five years already underway to support delivery of the mental health strategy. And in addition, we're providing support to Bipolar Scotland, which provides information, support and advice for people affected by bipolar disorder and those who care for them. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Bipolar disorder patients in Scotland are receiving treatments such as antidepressant monotherapy that are at best ineffective and at worst detrimental for long-term outcome, according to Professor Daniel Smith from Glasgow University. Lithium prescribed on its own is the recommended first-line treatment for bipolar disorder because of its proven effectiveness in preventing episodes of depression and mania. However, it is prescribed to only one in 20 patients. Can I ask the First Minister what action her government is taking to address this important issue? Would she agree with Alison Cairns, the Chief Executive of Bipolar Scotland, that we need to see more patient-clinician partnerships in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do uh, agree with that. The Scottish Government expects all patients with bipolar disorder to have access to appropriate and evidence-based uh, treatments with individual prescribing decisions, of course made by clinicians, but made in partnership with their patients. We've set a national standard in Scotland to outline the monitoring requirements of people treated with lithium uh, and details uh, of that were sent to health and care services in June uh, 2017. Uh, and using that benchmark, we can improve the quality of care and treatment we provide, improve patient safety and reduce what is an established health inequality. Uh, individual health boards, of course, will determine how best to undertake this monitoring, but it is very important that it is done. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. First Minister, whether the merger of Police Scotland and the British Transport Police has been permanently abandoned. First Minister. Well, we remain committed to the devolution of railway policing as uh, agreed by all parties in this parliament during the Smith Commission. Uh, we've worked with stakeholders on options to improve the accountability of railway policing in Scotland. Uh, there is consensus that legislation currently in force could be used to create an arrangement that facilitates a stronger role for the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, the SPE and the British Transport Police Authority are considering how this should be done and they aim to present proposals to their respective boards in the coming months. It would be premature to rule out any option at this time, but any proposal must enhance the accountability of railway policing in Scotland while ensuring the safety and the security of the travelling public. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, and I thank the First Minister for that response. But after almost two years and hundreds of thousands of taxpayers' of pounds being spent trying to find a way of achieving integration of BTP into Police Scotland, it is clear to everyone, if not the First Minister, that it's simply not possible. Yeah. The uncertainty that staff and officers have faced will not end until full integration is permanently ruled out. So can I ask the First Minister to take the opportunity now to go beyond the letter that was sent to staff and officers this week saying that they will not transfer and confirm that this plan for full integration has been permanently scrapped? And actually, will she take the opportunity to confirm when the repeal of the fatally flawed Railway Policing Act Scotland uh, will take place? First Minister. Well, I think it's... Daniel uh, Johnson recognises uh, this is a challenging piece of work, it's a complex piece of work and considerable work has been done uh, to assess all of the risks uh, and challenges. We've engaged with stakeholders uh, throughout this process, a stakeholder engagement event was held in November to explore uh, all options. Uh, the option currently developed, of course, will see a new committee established to oversee railway policing in Scotland, which would comprise members of both the Scottish Police Authority and the British Transport Police Authority. Uh, both of those authorities have been working closely on the proposed terms of reference for that new committee. Uh, they're making good progress on that, and it's hoped they'll be in a position to present proposals to the respective boards in the coming months. And I'll give an undertaking today that the Cabinet Secretary will update Parliament once those negotiations are concluded. So I think that's the right way uh, to proceed, to make sure that we have arrangements in place that do enhance the accountability of railway policing in Scotland, which I hope all members would want to see, but also ensuring the safety and security of the travelling public. And of course, those uh, who work on our trans in our transport police as well. Liam Kerr to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the outset, I would like to thank all the officers, staff, experts, academics and colleagues from across the chamber for forcing the SNP to concede that erecting a border on Britain's railways is a dreadful idea. But can the First Minister tell us how much taxpayers' money 
has been wasted pursuing full integration thus far? And will she admit that control room infrastructure cannot be replaced on the cheap? First Minister. Well, at least we know we have trains uh, when uh, the UK Tory government let contracts for ferries. They don't check that they have ferries uh, to, to do it. But seriously, I mean, this, this, is a, a serious, this is a serious issue. And I would, I would also pay tribute to those who, who work uh, in our transport police. But the Tories here uh, are not exactly in a consistent position. The Tories in their 2016 yeah. Scottish election manifesto uh, actually advocated uh, merger. Let me quote it. We will create a national infrastructure police force bringing together the civil nuclear constabulary, the Ministry of Defence Police and the British Transport Police uh, to improve the protection of critical infrastructures. The idea that the Tories uh, have so always supported uh, retaining the British Transport Police as a standalone entity is, uh, I'm afraid, not supported by the evidence or the facts. Uh, so that is the case. We will continue to take this forward in a proper way. I think the work that has been done uh, now is extremely solid. And when uh, that is concluded, the Cabinet Secretary will come back to Parliament to update members in the usual way. Lee MacArthur, to be followed by John Mason. Thank you very much. A recent academic paper by Dr Kath Murray and Dr Colin Atkinson concluded, while cutting losses at this stage will carry short-term political and reputational consequences, such a decision would stem the escalating financial, professional and personal costs. Mm. Years were wasted on the full integration model. So why will the First Minister not take this opportunity now to rule out that option for good? First Minister. Well, I, I've already uh, set out to the Chamber, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has done previously, uh, the work that has been done to get to the right solution. And I think it's important that that work continues. But in the interest of balance, given that I've just done it with the Conservative manifesto, uh, the Liberal Democrat manifesto in 2016 said they would, and I quote, transfer control of the British Transport Police to Police Scotland, uh, but seek to retain the ring-fenced expertise of officers on transport-related matters. So I've read out the full, the full extract. The fact of the matter is uh, parties are not uh, necessarily taking the same position now as they did previously, but that, of course, is history. What is important now is that we get this right and we will continue to support the work that has been done to ensure that that happens. John Mason to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the First Minister would accept that the ordinary constituents in my constituency do not understand why there should be one police force for the street outside the railway station and a separate police force for the railway station itself. And uh, my ordinary constituents want a much more joined up approach than we have had in the past. First Minister. Well, John, John Mason, I think, makes an important point. He makes an important point because whatever. Whatever our individual views are on the best arrangements, I suspect most members of the public would simply want politicians to sort out the structures and the arrangements so that they can have confidence in their police uh, wherever uh, they need the services of those police. And of course, uh, if there are, for example, terrorist incidents on a transport network, it will be often Police Scotland resources that are brought to bear uh, to help with the resilience uh, in those cases. So it is important that we have greater accountability for the British Transport Police, uh, that we have as much integration around use of resources as possible and that we put the right uh, structures in place to support that. That is what we are working towards doing and uh, we are determined to get it right in the interest of everybody, those who work in the service and those who use the service as well. And John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Does the First Minister share my concern that there are hundreds of police officers in Scotland here who can exercise the power of arrest in our citizens, who can enter and search their premises, but they have no political accountability in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, well, the, the point about accountability is one that I have uh, made on several occasions already today. It is important to improve the accountability uh, to uh, the Scottish arrangements of the, the British Transport Police. That is one of the motivations behind the work that is underway and why it's important that we allow uh, this work to reach a conclusion. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to Member's Business in the name of Annabel Ewing on Settled Status Scheme for EU Citizens in Scotland. We'll just take a short suspension to allow Members and Ministers and the Gallery to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>